Hey, everybody. This is Frank Chen with REIClub.com. I want to welcome you to our very first podcast um, where, we gonna, where we interview experts from around the nation as well as talk about what's going on with real estate in your neck of the woods. Now, on the screen, you probably see a, a familiar face. That is Camille Baptiste with REIClub.com. She's our content manager. And what we're going to be doing here on these calls on a weekly basis, hopefully, is to really cover some topics that you guys want to hear and want to learn about. Now, before we get started, we have a few announcements for you. The first one being, of course, if you haven't already, please sign up for our newsletter. You get some really cool bonuses. But more importantly, you get really, uh, you get really up-to-date information about what's going on with real estate, has really cool specials, resources, and tools that we have to offer. Also, check out our YouTube video at youtube.com forward slash REI Club. Um, we have over 180 videos there right now. We post up new videos every other week. It's a great resource for you if you're looking for quick five-minute tips on how to succeed in real estate. So uh, we have a few questions we're going to talk about today. Really, today's topic is for you guys to get to know us a little bit better, especially if you have been on our webinars or have submitted questions or have just simply been a long-term member. We love having you here. Thanks so much for being here. So, Camille, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Frank. Thanks for asking. Fantastic. Well, if I don't know you want to do it's kind of strange because I'm usually on the other side of the video. Right, right. And I just want to make a quick, quick announcement. I want to brag, but... Camille was actually featured in our local newspaper today. It couldn't have been better timing. I saw it on Facebook, Camille. Um, Camille is a cyclist, but what's really, really cool about that is she actually just learned how to uh, cycle. Was it last year? Yeah, Frank. Thanks for outing me. Yes. Uh, so that was really cool. It was like a, it was a really long article. I went through it today. I think it's really awesome that you're staying out there fit and as well as real estate investing and being a full time mom. You're just you're overwhelmed over there, aren't you? Thanks, Frank. Actually, no. It's just real estate investing is how and it helped me in be able to explore some of those passion because it gives me some free time that I could uh, explore the things that I didn't have a chance to explore when I was busy in school all the time and working for corporate America. So with that being said, I'm curious, you know, how did you, you know, get started? I know we work together, but I know we both do real estate, but how did you get your start in real estate? Well, uh, about seven, eight years ago, I was a stay-at-home mom and I had just left corporate America and had this huge buyout package. And I figured, what can I do with my time to make money, but still allow me to be here for my kids and my family? And that time, my husband was traveling like all over the world for his job. He was a, a engineer for a semiconductor engineer. Mm. And so I actually ran across reiclub.com. That was the very first real estate investing website that I ever ran oh, across. No way. I started no reading their articles. Yeah. And I started to read their articles. At that time, videos wasn't a big deal, but they had uh, teleseminars. Right. And I would listen to a few teleseminars. Right, the phone and, call ones, yeah. Yes. And then I said, you know what? I could take some of this money and buy a few houses. So I started to pay attention to some of the things that I was learning. I made tons of mistakes in the beginning. And then I ran across um, Russ Whitney. Oh, okay. I was doing a local seminar here in Austin, in the Austin, San Antonio area. And I went to a little three-day seminar. And then I thought I had all the information in the world. And I said, I'm going to be a real estate investor. And then since then, right. I started buying houses, rehabbing them, holding them for rentals. And then one of these, about a year or two into that, REI Club was looking for um, some help. Right. And the next, and REI Club happened to be in the same state I was in. So it was a no-brainer. I went out and met the um, founder and owner of REI Club, and I've been uh, working for REI Club and a real estate investor ever since. And, and still a mom. That's right. If you, I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but Camille and I actually were hired on REI Club around the same time. Um, and it's, it's a very interesting thing because we're one of the two people that have, were started at the, around the same time and then we're still here with REI Club. Um, we're still actively investing and it's really great to hear your background, Camille. And for those of you who may not know about how I got my start, uh, I know that some of you may know that I do buy and holds. I do a lot of landlording and it's, it's been a family business. But where I really began was in junior high. I know it's really early, but it was... <laughs> It was a family business, you know, it was a family business. My mom, she started out as a realtor, then she became uh, an investor. My dad got his license, they were piggybacking off each other. But me, being the youngest child, you know, 
I was at every single rehab project, fixing up stuff, learning how to do, you know, fixing electrical work, plumbing, really getting to know tenants. And I started branching into management, managing all the properties. At our peak, we had like 50 properties in Dallas, Mesquite, Garland area in Texas. So I really got immersed in this. And the older I got, the understanding of freedom, the understanding of finances started to kick in. And when I got to college, I bought my first rental property. It was actually supposed to be a flip, made a lot of mistakes um, on the rehab side and uh, went over my budget and very, you know, typical for a first time investor. But it's been a rental property, hasn't been vacant for the past five years, I'm thinking. And I flipped another property in downtown Austin, which is a super hot area now. So, yeah, it all, it all started really young for me. But I think it's the attraction of the income, the freedoms, and really the type of people who get involved in this business that I really like to surround myself with. People like Camille, people here at REI Club. So it's really, really great. Um, so now you guys know I have a little back background of who your REI Club members are. And the next thing I would like to talk about is, you know, let's talk about some of the mistakes. You know, I know people on our call today, um, some are going to be new investors, some are going to be more experienced. But uh, for our newer investors, what are some mistakes, Camille, that you made that you feel could they could learn from and maybe avoid when they get started? All right, I got a mistake. <laughs> my very first quick. flip project. Yes, my very first flip project I purchased, it was about... 20 miles from my house, and it took me about 30 minutes to 45 minutes to get there every day. So that's mistake, not necessarily mistake number one, but you need to consider your commute time. If you do have a project, you need to stay on top of it to be on top of your contractors and meet with, with potential um, buyers and, 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 and real estate investors. But I was a stay-at-home mom, so it wasn't too bad. I just had to schedule. So my very first flip deal I bought, and... Rehabbed it. Of course, I went over budget. I hired the wrong contractor. They put the wrong paint. But I was there every day, and I was kind of trying to stay on top of it so that it wouldn't get too much out of control. Mm -hmm. And then I went to my realtor. I used the same one that I purchased the deal with. It was a foreclosure, a HUD foreclosure. i never forget that. And I told her, listen, I want to flip this deal, and I, let's price it right. But it was a bunch of foreclosures in the neighborhood at the same time mm. and a bunch of rehabs going on at the same time that when I was buying my project, I didn't see it. it started to all show up while I was actually rehabbing. Oh, no. So all of those started to hit the market or you had more foreclosures going up as well as rehab deals going through. So I was like kind of in the middle. And I told her if I don't have too much holding costs, so if it doesn't sell within 90 days, at the 59th day, I want you to put it up for lease. Mm, okay. Because I only had three months of holding costs. Oh, I got you. Budget. So uh, I said, put it up for a lease deal, put it up for a lease buy. Um, based Oops. on... When was this around? What year was this around? Around 2008. Okay. So you guys all know what's going on around 2008, 2000. Tons of foreclosure, tons yeah. of short sales. But you got a deal when it was a good deal, but only to know like right around the corner what was waiting for her. So. Yes. <laughs> we hold this huge open house, two oh, of them. Man. We had all of these we were, um, all of these positive feedbacks. And we didn't have any offers that would stick. Right. And then um, mistake number one, I hired this... Um, Home inspector. Oh, okay. That I used before on all my properties, and he gave me a good deal. But I didn't necessarily bet him properly. Mm -hmm. And so there was a huge crack along my garage floor. So foundation potential issues. Well, I didn't know that. I'm a right. newbie. Right, right, I okay. I thought it was a crack, and I thought if there was a foundation issue, he's already done six deals with me, he would have told me. And so let me speed the story up. He didn't say anything. We have a buyer on the table, full price. I think we would, I picked it up for 82. I put like 15 in it and I was selling it for 139. So my net was probably gonna be close to 20,000. First okay. deal. Um, inspection came through, you know, they have a 10 day waiting period to close out. Right. They did not share the report until the ninth day and back out of the deal because their inspector didn't trust the crack. Ah, uh, okay. 
So my real estate, uh, my agent made me call. The house was still fairly a new build, so it was still under the builder's warranty. So they made me try to find the builder's warranty, had the foundation people come out. They did their measuring. They had rolled balls down, blue, <laughs> all kind of stuff. Oh, my gosh. And then they said it was just cosmetic. So that one little mistake. That one little mistake. Turned off a, turned off somebody to buying her home. Yes. That's so, a it made them scared because they were first time oh. home buyers and they had a new baby that was made that was under a year old, months, months old. Right. I would probably be scared too. Oh, I see. Right. And then right, my right. husband said, Man, we've been working on this property for months. Had we known that, we could have slapped some paint or some sealant on that crack. <laughs> And so, a little quick fix, yeah. Yeah, we're going to do a quick fix. Yeah. So during that time, I remember I said 45 days, I found somebody to lease it. Yep. And they gave me a 3000 buyer's option, and we kind of set it up for a lease to purchase. Okay. Tenant from hell. Moved on, another tenant. It was all in your first deal, correct? No, on my first... My first flip deal. Okay. All the rest, all the other deals I have been rehabbing and holding as rental properties. And at that time, I had wholesale only one deal. Mm. And I had set up one kind of syndicate deal in that I put a bunch of buyers together and they gave me a check for putting up for a big deal because I couldn't do the deal. It was just too big for me. Right. Okay. So this is my first official flip deal. Fast forward three years later. Finally sold the house this year, and I made my net check was forty something thousand, forty three. Oh, okay. Forty seven. It was earlier this year, and I've sold a couple of houses since then because I've been broke. But <laughs> um, <laughs> it was good but, reason to sell a house. So mistake to make is always have an exit strategy, a one, a plan A and a plan B. So here I have this flip deal thinking I was going to be in and out and I invested a lot of money in it and yeah. I wasn't in and out. It took three years later for me to realize I almost kind of doubled my profits. Right. But it took three years for me to deal with a property I didn't want to deal with in a residential neighborhood that wasn't necessarily ideal for rentals because it had a homeowners association. So every time they were late one day cutting their yard, I would get a notice. <laughs> I'll get a threat for a fine. Yeah, the agent ways are they're brutal. Yeah, they're brutal. and so the homeowners association bill was two hundred and thirty-five dollars every year. I have to write that, and I had to price the rental or the property just right, so that when taxes went up, and when the homeowners insurance was due and the insurance was due, that I'll be covered. Right. If that makes any sense, and still be competitive in the market. So one of the first mistakes I made was not really paying attention to detail not really going out there with my inspector to figure out what's what because I trusted right. him thinking he would know what he was doing and I've used him so many times he would hit me to things like this. Right. And then um, mistake, it, it wasn't necessarily a mistake, but my fallback is having good exit strategies. I think you covered a lot of good points there, Camille. I think like when you're starting out, a lot of the mistakes you make is you trust too much yes. the other person, whether it's talking to a contractor or is it talking to an inspector, even a realtor? You know, you're just going to be asking them questions, and more than likely, you're going to believe 90% of the things they're going to say, whether they're right or wrong, just because you don't know what the right answer is. Um, so that, that's an interesting point. You know, the hiring uh, um, an, uh, an inspector or you know, dealing, you know, having an exit strategy. I had a, my first deal was very similar to that as well. We we. I bought the deal. It was pre-2009. It was like right after, it was September of 2008. I remember clearly. Um, I bought the property for 110. The market value at the time was roughly around 155. I, I budgeted around 20,000 for it, but I went over about eight grand. So I spent about 28 on there. So it was about 138 total, 155. So I was roughly going to pull out around 17 to $20,000. So I think that's a good, I think most people investing, that's a good number to reference, right? If you're going to flip a property, fifteen to 20000 is worth your while if after all is said and done. But once I put all the money in, I had to deal with my contractors. That itself was brutal. Um, I overpaid for my paint. I overpaid for materials. I overpaid for labor. 
Um, but I was new to the market. I didn't know what the cost per square footage was. So this was re- all really a learning experience for me. I never made those mistakes again. Uh, but probably after that, like once they fixed up the property, it was vacant for nine months because 2008, we priced it too high. We priced it too high, but I had so much money to be, to be made that I had that flexibility. But after nine months hit, I was like, this is just, we reduced the price three times. We started off, I think it was like 165 and we lowered it all the way down to, I think, 150 Still nothing. So we took it off the market. We rented it within the first month. And since then, it's never been vacant. So maybe I think I live in this in a rental area because we have a lot of rental properties where I live. So, um, But I think the biggest mistakes I made were I didn't budget correctly for my contractors. Um, I wasn't aware of what's really was going on in my neighborhood, in my property. So I wasn't uh, – I didn't have a good idea of what prices were or conditions of other homes were. Uh, I just thought, you know, here's what has been bought and sold. I think I can do the same. But there were a lot of other variables that I ignored, and it kind of bit me in my butt. So I would say, just like, you know, Camille said, have an exit strategy. You know, I could have probably rented the property out five months earlier because it saved on those five months of holding costs, right? Property tax, insurance, mm-hmm. all that jazz that could really hurt your bottom line. So it seems like it's really nice to know that both of our first deals generally were pretty similar. So if you're out there, and you've had a similar like situation, or maybe this is one of your fears. You know, I think that's what stops people from doing their first year is that this this potential problem. Would you agree? I would agree, and I want to share also what I did right. Okay, there you go. Some of what I did right, I actually learned from REI Club and going to a couple of those little free seminars for real estate Very investing, cool. um, and um, jumping on a webinar. One of the things that I did right was. I um, took time to look in a market. I looked in a neighborhood. I looked in a zip code. And I just started watching what things were pricing for. What was really good, like top of the class. What was, oh, my God, handyman fixer up pricing. Right. When I got an idea of what pricing, what the pricing was, all I did was submit offers. Oh. Out of every 10 offers I submit, one got accepted. But. Every nine that got rejected, I learned something new. So, for example, sometimes uh, there was a property selling for 80000 and I submitted an offer for 37800 And I could have easily afforded forty two. Mm-hmm. But to the owner or the seller, that was more than half. They wasn't even willing to negotiate or even look at that. And it was mm-hmm. just on the market for 10 days. Right. And so sometimes something as simple as... A thirty-six thousand dollar offer and a a thirty-six five hundred dollar offer is sounds so much worse than a thirty-seven one hundred dollar. Even though it's a five hundred dollar difference, yeah. I know that people were sensitive to numbers that they see that they see. The second thing I started doing is I started submitting offers directly through the listed agents. Okay. They had to submit that offer, even right. if it was low. They had to. Some real estate agents, if they know that you're an investor, they don't want to deal with you or they figure, oh, that's too low or they're not going to make any money. But if you deal sub- directly with the listing agent, by law, they have to present that offer. So sometimes they, con- they counter back. And so I counter back sometimes offering more, but I reduce their 6% commission to 5%. And so the 1% more that I offered came from there. So some people don't realize that, that the realtor fee is negotiable. That's a very good point. It, it, it definitely is. And that's why we talk about building rapport with your, with your agents. Um, it's harder to ask. It's a harder to ask if you just met the person. They have, you have no tracker. They don't know who you are. Um, but, yes, the 6% is not set in stone. So just keep that in mind. You know, if you do have a friend who is a realtor, you know, take them out to lunch and maybe you can uh, schmooze them a bit. <laughs> And then the last thing that I think that was important, every time I kept submitting an offer and a buyer would reject, sometimes they would reject with the reason why. That's nice, yep. And so sometimes it could have been time or it could have been I was too vague because I had and or signs on it or something (laughs) crazy. And so I had a real estate agent look over, I paid a real estate agent and attorney to look over my contract. So I had like a basic letter or email I was sent to submit and I used a basic contract to send. Or sometimes I would tell the agent, hey, I want to submit this offer 
to the listing agent and they will write my contract up for me. Yeah. So those are a couple of the things I did right. A couple of the things, I know we're running short on time, a couple of the tips and tricks that I use is I use Google Voice. Okay. What and do you use so Google Voice for? I use it for a lot of my advertising. So if I, if I list a phone number on a bandit sign or if I list a phone number on an email, it automatically gets routed to Google Voice, but a lot of that gets sent to me via email. So I have transcripts of nice. things. And so I don't always have to be there. So my, my marketing could be working for me, but Google Voice is free. Sometimes I can have a ring over, but it's perfect for dealing, for dealing with tenants and, and it's perfect for dealing with bandit signs. So that's one free tip that I want to give out to our um, listeners or viewers. I'm not sure. <laughs> They're, they're going to be both. They're both. They're going to be both our listeners and viewers for today. How about you? You have any tips that you want to share? Sure, sure. Yeah, of course. And I just want to like piggyback off your, your realtors and saying listing agents have to submit them. And um, I actually had a fire realtor that I used who I bought. I flipped a property with. He helped me buy a property. had a really good relationship. Um, we had this convention here. We had a lot of investors here, and I required his help. And every time we were submitting offers, of course, they were lowball. You know, a lot of times people are asking you to do 20, 30, 40 cents on the dollar. And... Agents who have never worked with an investor before, when you tell them to submit like a 40 cents on the dollar offer, they're going to be like, You're, this is hurts my reputation if I do yes. this. Yes. But the bottom line is, it's like, I'm here to make money. I'm here to make you money. I'm not here to hear you give me back mouth all the time. Like, I know the numbers. I'm hiring you to be my agent. There are hundreds of other agents who would love to work with me. So don't ever let an agent pin you in a corner, make you feel that you're not doing something right. Um, especially if you've done your research, your due diligence, and you know the numbers, you you know, back and front, just have the confidence in yourself. Because I'll tell you, to get your real estate agent's license, it's not that hard. Anybody can really do it. <laughs> uh, not, you know, not downplaying agents at all, but what defines a good agent from a bad agent is how they handle situations like this. So that's something just to keep in mind. Now, to answer your question, Camille, some tips that I use, um, I'm more of a very internet-based person. Um, I like to, but so I use Google Drive. I use this thing called Jing. I like to hire VAs. I like people to help maintain um, or automate my systems. So, uh, for instance, Jing is a Camtasia-type free software. It can record up to five minutes screen capture or anything like that. You could use it for advertising, creating, um, yeah, creating you know advertising, or you could create little short videos for your VAs. Or if you say have a kid or a, like a child who you want to get involved in this business and you want to teach them something that. Uh, it's almost like number crunching or uh, what do you call that work? Are you, are you just data entry or whatever yeah, it is? Uh -huh. Or if they need to scrub maybe a county court record list, you could just create short videos, put them into a file and just have your, you know, assistant or your, you know, child do that as a summer project. You know, it's very, very helpful. This is what I did. I went to the, I know growing up, I would always go to the, um, Real start, uh, uh, the real estate office and do the MLS and just my mom would give me a criteria and just be like, find everything you can and print out everything that fits the <laughs> criteria. I would literally print out 20 to 30 properties a day. And on top of that, she would bring me out to see every property that she thought was actually a good deal. So that's tremendous value there. Um, and honestly, like again, it's these are all free resources that you can do. Tap into the MLS as long as you have a realtor in place. Um, you know, so... One of the advice I always give people, you know, they're always on REI Club. We have tons and tons of resources here um, where, you know, if you're really starting out brand new and fresh, unless you're, you know, eager to really hurry up and make some money, you don't have to spend a lot of money to get started, if any at all. You know, you have private money to help fund your deals. There's tons of resources of how to build your marketing lists, tons of resources to how to find your first buyer, connect them with your sellers. Like, Tons of information out there, you know, and a lot of it is on reiclub.com. We have thousands of articles, hundreds of videos. Um, so be sure to check those out if you haven't already. Um, I want to just take, cover a few more things before we conclude today's call, Camille. Again, we're trying to keep these calls within 30 to 60 minutes. And of course, um, hopefully there's a way for you guys to leave feedback. Otherwise, um, we would love if you left us a contact form. If you went to reiclub.com, filled out a contact form. Let us know that you enjoyed today's call. Um, we're going to figure out a way where you can leave us feedback, give us recommendations on calls or topics you want to hear in the future. But um, one last question for you, Camille, is, you know, 
Where do you see real estate right now, you know, in our current market, not just in Texas, but all over around the U.S.? Like, where do you feel that real estate is heading? Do you feel like we're heading more toward the digital market to, or do you feel like what we're doing five, 10 years ago is still going to work five and 10 years from now? I think that what we're doing five, 10 years ago is still applicable to today, but it has been the speed and the delivery has changed. Ooh, okay. It is because of the digital age and because of social media, everything is faster now. Um, although Craigslist is still an effective way to advertise deals, to find new deals or to advertise your own deals. If you don't have a quick video walkthrough of the property or some photos, it is not going to get the time of day. Especially with everybody thumbing through everything. Yeah. If you don't have the thumb. If, you, if you're not thumb worthy, they're going to keep scroll, keep scrolling. And so in today's age, there's still a lot of deals out there for both wholesaling, rehab, flipping. It may mean that you may also need to cherry pick, but never, 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 never is there a better time to invest in real estate than now because the days on market is short. Super short. People have money. They're finding money. They're getting low, low interest rates. So even if you make, maybe you don't make 19000 on a deal or 39000 Maybe you make twelve. Maybe you make $25,000. do not be greedy. You want to look for speed and turnover. And one, of the, one other tip I want to add. Yeah. I managed and owned over 30 rental properties. And I've only had two months of vacancy. And one of the things that I did was I came up with a tenant referral program. And so... The first thing I do if I know I'm about to have a, uh, I make sure I stay on top of my lease and give 30 days no, 90 days notice. So if I have a, a lease coming up for for, for for rental, I would know right away. Mm. And I go to the tenant next door. I said, "Hey, you know anybody who wants to move in? Because I, you know, we have a. Did you know we have a two hundred and fifty dollar referral program? And I never let them know I own the property. I always let them know I'm the property manager." And then about twice a year, I send out a notice just to let everybody know how you're doing uh, around holiday time and Christmas time. I always send out something and I let them know, hey, we have a tenant referral program. So I have leads coming into me. And so at the most, I've had one month down for another property and in another property, the one that um, my first flip deal, that was vacant for about two months because they, I had to evict them. Um. So okay, I lied. Three months. Um, but. <laughs> One of the things that you need to do, and this is not necessarily for the beginner investor, but for the intermediate guy or the guy who has a few rental properties or want to get into rentals, that's one of the tips that I use. And that's the old school people trick. You need people now to keep your um, your rentals filled and your vacancies low. Right. But in today's market, right for wholesaling, it's right for dealing with notes because a lot of because notes, a lot of people are selling deals that they did a couple years ago to get in for quick cash. Perfect, perfect, perfect for rentals as well because you also have a huge amount of college students that want their first home, but they don't uh, necessarily have the credit to buy it. So um, it's just right. You just got to figure out what you want to do, how you want to do it, and how much time you want to put in. Never, 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 never tell yourself you can't and always, always submit the offer. You just never know what could happen. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Camille. I could not have said it any better. Um, that was actually better than what I probably would have said. So thanks for laying that out there and agree. You know, I think being in a unique position where I'm always hearing the feedback from our members, from students, people who have attended our webinars and um, who have been with us for several years, I think fundamentally the biggest thing that I've noticed between successful students and those that are still struggling and just spinning their wheels are the people who are actually taking action and not just buying home study courses. They're the ones that are applying, whether they're on webinars, they're pulling their nuggets of information, they're attending calls like this. Um, they're just really trying to um, increase their amount of knowledge. Now, don't become a professional student where all you're doing is buying courses, attending webinars, attending live events. You know, you don't, you don't need those very much. You know, just you got to apply what you're learning. And you got to ask questions and don't be scared to really take that first leap. For me, it's exciting. It's, it's more than exciting because of what you do learn from those mistakes, you know? When you buy a home study course, that's like a ladder. It lays out, you know, a ladder you open, it heads you, it points in the direction of up. But until you decide to step on those rungs and keep going up and up, you will never reach the top. You will always stay at the bottom. And there are some things in real estate investing you will never know or experience until you actually do. 
that first HUD when you have a deal, that first rejection of no and the seller tells you because I want something to close in 10 days, that first agent that said, no, I'm not submitting this lowball offer. None of those things, nobody could really prepare you for those unless you go through it. But that's all part of the process. Just like a butterfly, you got to break through the cocoon before you can fly. <laughs> I love your analogies, Camille. They're, they're crazy. They're cra so you guys need to get ready to just <laughs> break through the cocoon. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, it, it's, it's true. It, it is very, very true. You know, I, I, there's really no much else to say about it. You know, just break through that fear. You know, try to take the advice that we give you. And if you have any questions, that's what we're here for. You know, we want to be that resource for you because I think one of the biggest things we hate the most is when our students, members leave, go home, get off these calls, and they're just sitting there in their chair thinking, man, I have all these questions. I don't know. Like, then there's really no point for you to have the call if, you, if you're not going to ask those questions or at least try to find the answers to your questions. Mm -hmm. So, please. Visit our website if you haven't already. Send us a contact form with any questions you have. Attend our webinars. Attend these calls. The more you do for yourself, the more you invest in yourself, um, the more results and, and uh, the results you're going to see in your life. So, guys, I want to thank you so much. Camille, this is really great for our first call. Thank you guys so much for being here. We're going to be interviewing some other special guests in addition to covering some cool topics um, that you guys are going to be bringing to us. We're excited to be initiating this for you um, moving forward and this year and on to next year and uh, so on and so forth. So so, guys, thank you so much for listening. But be sure, before you sign off, to go ahead and uh, subscribe to our podcast. If you haven't already, give us a five-star rating. Let us know that you liked it. It really five does help stars. us out. Five stars. We won't take anything less than that. And, again, um, if you haven't already subscribed to our newsletter, you can do that at reiclub.com forward slash update. Again, it's reiclub.com forward slash update. Got some cool bonuses for you. And again, we're going to keep you up to date with what's going on with real estate around the nation, as well as when these videos are available to you to watch. We look forward to have you guys on next time. Take care, everybody, and bye-bye.